after an introduction like that, and that beautiful song we just listened to, I ought to be able to say something even if I am nearly 100 years old. <laughs> I greet you all this morning. I feel highly honored in having been invited to come and occupy this place, speak to you this morning, and particularly when I learned that you have 2,000 Mormon missionaries sitting over here on the right-hand side. So I greet all of you and tell you how happy I am and how much I love this institution and its officers and its faculty and now you students who are here today. During the past week, we've celebrated Thanksgiving's Day. And I suppose all of you have counted your blessings. I counted mine. And after doing so, I figured that I was about the most blessed man in the whole world. But it won't take time to tell you why. It'll take too long. And then I thought of having to speak to you here this morning that I assume that all of you have great reasons to be grateful. And one of them is that you're privileged to be students at this great institution. Not all of our youth have the privilege of attending a church institution like this where you sit in classes with men of God who have faith and testimony and can not only teach you the words of their your lessons, but to inspire you to want to live to be something worthwhile in the world. There are those who have uh, opposite opportunities. I thought as I tried to decide what to talk about today that I'd use for a text a couple little experiences that are opposite to your experience. Here, just a few years ago, I held a conference in Ogden and one of the presidents of the Young Men's Organization of the entire church attended that meeting and I had him speak. And in his talk, he said, a professor in one of our non-Mormon universities threw out a question like this in his class. Is there anyone in this class who believes that there's any way in the world that you can know a thing's gonna happen before it happens, and nobody answered. And he didn't say any more about it. And when my turn came, I said, if one of my children had been in that class, they might not have said anything, but they would have said, the poor man, I feel sorry for him. He didn't get his training out of the right books, or he didn't own something better than that. And um, then I had another experience. Um, one of our secretaries down in the, up in the church office building had a daughter attend a non-Mormon university. She had been in charge of the uh, junior Sunday school in her ward and uh, prayed with her people and so forth. And her professor so destroyed her faith that she resigned from the Sunday school and she refused to even kneel in prayer with her own family. And the mother came to me brokenhearted to see if she could get some help. And I said, well, I can't help her because I'm not a college graduate. But I said, I know how I can get your help. I said, I can make an appointment with a man who can get her back on the track, I'm sure, if she's willing to fill the appointment, and she was. And I made the appointment with Brother Henry Iring, and he got her back to her place in the church. A few years after that, I was down in South Los Angeles attending a conference, and after the conference, I ordained a young man a bishop, and I learned that he was the husband of this girl that I'm mentioning to you who lost her faith temporarily in uh, that uh, university. Now, um, he said there's no way that we could know a thing before it transpired. And I like the statement of Isaiah. He said, 
the Lord has declared the end from the beginning. That's prophecy. The Lord had a definite program, and he was able to declare it, and the way he declared it was through his holy prophets. Isaiah said, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And Peter said, We have a more sure word of prophecy, and we do well that we cleave unto it as, as unto a light shining in a dark place until the day star arise in our hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in olden time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved upon by the power of the Holy Ghost. That makes prophecy the word of the Lord, and we have many prophecies to that effect. Following the, Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me. And truly the prophets have t did, prophet, did testify of him and his coming. They outlined his life and ministry almost in detail, how he should be born of a virgin and how he should uh, uh, be persecuted and how he should finally be betrayed for three, three pieces of silver and how, she, how they would cast lot for his clothing at the time of his crucifixion. And not only did the prophets foretell his, foretell his coming in the meridian of times, but when he would come again in the latter day. And following his resurrection, as he walked along the way by two of his disciples on the way to Emmaus, and we're told that their eyes were holden, that they didn't recognize him. And when he heard what they had to say about him and his life and his ministry and his crucifixion and his resurrection, he realized that they didn't understand what he'd been trying to teach them. And so he said, O oh, fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And commencing with Moses and the prophets, he showed them how that in all things the prophets had testified of him. And then Peter tells us that he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's what the Lord has done in this, the dispensation of the fullness of times. He has opened the understanding of his prophets so that they understand the Holy Scriptures as no other people in the world really do. In the Book of Mormon, we're told in three places that we should study the prophecies of Isaiah because they would all be fulfilled. I like to study the prophecies of Isaiah. It seems to me that he almost lived more in our day than when he was actually here upon the earth. He saw so much of what would transpire in our day. And one of the prophecies of Isaiah that has impressed me ever since I was a boy was when he predicted the destruction of the great city of Babylon. At that time, Babylon was the greatest city in the entire world. And Isaiah said that it would be destroyed that it should become the abode of reptiles and wild animals, that the Arab had no more pitch his tent there. And then he added, and it shall never be rebuilt. Can you imagine anyone today speaking of one of our great cities and saying that it would be destroyed and never be rebuilt? Here a few years ago, President Kimball and Brother Hunter of the Twelve spent their holiday time over in the Holy Land. And when they returned, I said to Brother Hunter, did you see Babylon? He said, we saw what there was left of it. It's never been rebuilt to this day. And that's what the word of prophecy is when it comes inspired of the Lord. Then Isaiah 
as I tell you, we are told in three places to study his prophecies because they would all be fulfilled. Then the Lord, when he taught the Nephites, said that in the day of their fulfillment would be given to the Lord, to given to the people to understand them. Now, there isn't time to go into a lot of detail, but I'd like to mention briefly a few of Isaiah's prophecies. He saw the desert made to blossom as the rose. He saw us Mormons settle here in these valleys of the mountains and make it like a garden place. He saw the rivers flow in the desert where we built these great irrigation canals, some of them larger than rivers, in order to water this arid land. He saw the rivers flow down from the high places where we reservoirded in these mountain fastnesses to take care of our summer needs. He saw the daughters of Zion come up and sing in the heights of Zion. And where can you find anything to fulfill that in the history of the world, like the singing now of the Tabernacle Choir for over 50 years without a break? He saw a now with a tell star singing to the entire world. He saw the house of the God of Jacob established in the top of the mountains in the latter days, that all nations would flow unto it, and they would say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he might teach us of his ways, and we might walk in his paths. I think that temple up in Salt Lake is the very house of the God of Jacob. When I think of the saints attempting to build an edifice like that with nothing but their hands to build it with and a thousand miles from transportation, nobody except those who are inspired with such righteous desires as our pioneer fathers and mothers could have undertaken their work like that. And, the, and Isaiah saw that people in all nations would say, Come ye. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. And I filled my first mission over in Holland before there were uh, temples uh, beyond the, just here in the West. Well, our people had joined the church. The first thing they wanted to do was to come to America. They were willing to sacrifice everything, give up their homes and sell their furniture and give up their employment just to come to Zion. It was that temple that drew, drew them here. I had a very earnest investigator, a businessman, and he said, I'll never join your church. And I said, why? He said, I don't want to go to America. I said, good for you. I said, you just join the church and stay right here and help to uh, uh, take care of these branches. And he'd only been a member a few months when he came in my office one day and he said, Brother Richards, I have a chance to sell my business. I said, what do you want to sell your business for? Oh, I want to go to Zion, he said, and he came. And that <laughs> temple that Isaiah saw over 3,000 years ago that would be built in the tops of the mountains and that all nations would flow onto it and they would say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and so forth. They might walk, we might walk in his ways and learn of his paths. Then Isaiah saw the gathering of latter-day Israel. He saw the railroad train and the aeroplane. He said, who are they that fly about as the doves to their windows? He wasn't talking about birds. He was talking about people. And uh, then he told how they'd roar like the lion and so forth. And then he said that they would pick them up and bring them swiftly that they wouldn't even have time to loosen the shoe latchets of their shoes or to slumber or sleep. Just to illustrate that, when Brent McKay went to Europe a few years ago for the dedication of the chapel in the little country town, little town where his mother had been raised, <clears throat> upon his return in reporting to us, brethren, the 12, he said he left uh, London at two o'clock in the afternoon. He spent a little time with uh, the brethren in Chicago and he was in his own bed that night in Salt Lake. 
he didn't have time to slumber or sleep like like uh, John, no, like Isaiah saw all those thousands of years ago when all they had for means of travel were camels and oxen and donkeys and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> then he compared it with when his parents came to Zion in the early days when they were 43 days on the water with a sail vessel and then um, weeks getting across the plains. See what's happened just in this day when the Lord was to bring forth his work in power in the earth. Well, these are some of the things, the prophecies that uh, that Isaiah saw. Then he saw also the day when people would draw near him with their mouths and with their lips would honor him, but their hearts would be far removed from him and they would teach for doctrine the precepts of men. Therefore, he said, the lie of the Lord will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. We have that marvelous work and a wonder. It's a great thing what the Lord has done in opening the heavens and sending holy messengers back to this earth to restore the keys of his gospel and the various responsibilities in his church to prepare the way for his second coming. Now there are many, many more prophecies such as when John was banished upon the Isle of Patmos and uh, he saw the power that would be given to Satan to make war with the saints and to overcome them and to reign over every nation. Then he saw uh, the, another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The everlasting gospel is the only gospel that can save us and that we learn through revelation for John told us that the Lord would bring it forth to be preached to every nation. And then we have the testimony of Jesus himself of the signs of his second coming uh, when uh, there isn't time to go into the details, but he uh, told about the wars and the rumors of wars and the pestilence, the earthquakes and the famine and so forth. And then he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, uh, we don't only have the dead prophets that we honor today, but we honor the living prophets. And before I close, I'd like to read you one little statement uttered by President Wilford Woodruff in the General Conference back in 1898. He told about when he first met the prophet Joseph Smith in a testimony meeting of the priesthood. And uh, he said, uh, he said he met the prophet for the first time when he attended a meeting where many of the brethren bore testimony of the restoration. When they got through, the prophet said, brethren, I have been very much edified and instructed in your testimonies here tonight. But I want to say to you before the Lord that you know no more about the future destiny of this church and kingdom than a babe upon its mother's lap. He said, you don't comprehend it. It is only a little handful of priesthood you see here tonight. But this church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world. It will fill the Rocky Mountains. And this was 14 years before our first group came here to the Rocky Mountains, uh, fill the Rocky Mountains. And there they will open the door for the establishment of the gospel among the Lamanites. And now I could realize just how much the Lamanites are responding to the church today. They're converting them by the thousands. And then he said that it should fill North and South America. Now, that, if he weren't a prophet, 
How could he make such a statement as that? And we believe in the living prophets. Now, I want to read you just one little excerpt from the Time magazine of August 1978 uh, discussing Mormonism, a kingdom apart. Just as the saints once made the desert bloom through honeybee-like enterprise, so have they made their church into the biggest, richest, strongest faith ever born on U.S. soil. It has grown fourfold since World War II to uh, four million members, including one million outside of the United States. Now, isn't that wonderful? Talk about marvelous work on the wonder. I gotta quit. <laughs> I hope you folks believe in living prophets today, and if you'll keep close to the church, and Marion Romney was called to be an assistant of the 12. President Grant said, Marion, you keep your eye on the president of this church, you'll never go astray. I say that to each of you today. He's a great leader, and if we'll follow him with all our hearts and souls and give him the strength of our ability and our prayers, this kingdom will continue to roll forward. And as the prophet Joseph said, it will not only fill North and South America, but it will fill the world. And that's my testimony to you, and I pray God to bless you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.